the USS Washington might be the most famous U.S. battleship that was not preserved after her service as a museum ship. Lovingly nicknamed the Rusty W. by her crew, the Washington was the only fast battleship of the U.S. Navy to ever sink an enemy battleship. Designated BB-56, she was the second North Carolina-class fast battleship to be built. She was commissioned just prior to U.S. involvement in World War II and saw extensive action in the Pacific Theater. Named in honor of the 42nd state, Washington earned 13 battle stars for her service and participated in almost every major naval campaign of the Pacific War. The North Carolina class consisted of two ships, Washington and her sister, North Carolina, and they were the first class of U.S. battleships to be built since the completion of the Colorado class in the early 1920s. This was due to the signing of the Washington Naval Treaty in 1922 and the subsequent London Naval Treaties of 1930 and 1936. The Navy wanted to improve upon the speed and firepower of the standard-type battleships that were then in service. But, with the 35,000-ton limitation imposed by the international treaties, they found it hard to come up with a design that met all of their requirements. Eventually, after much back and forth, a design was approved that would feature 12 of the recently developed 14-inch 50 caliber Mark B guns and be able to make 27 knots. The Secretary of the Navy then ordered that the design needed to have the ability to be able to switch from quadruple 14-inch to triple 16-inch turrets if the escalator clause in the Second London Naval Treaty was invoked, which many believed it would be. President Roosevelt was initially against arming American ships with 16-inch guns out of a matter of principle. He believed that the United States should not be the first nation to change the principles that were laid down in the Washington and London treaties. However, under pressure from his admirals, he finally relented, and the United States invoked the Escalator Clause. Thus, Washington's main battery was changed to nine 16-inch, 45 caliber Mark VI guns housed in three three-gun turrets. Washington could hurl the newly designed super-heavy 2,700-pound armor-piercing projectile 23 miles with these guns. She would also have an incredible secondary punch in the form of 25-inch, 38-caliber dual-purpose, Mark 12 guns housed in 10 turrets located amidships. These were highly effective against surface targets and for fire support, but were particularly effective later on as anti-aircraft weapons once the proximity fuse was introduced. At this point, Washington had a modest amount of mostly ineffective smaller anti-aircraft weapons. This included four quadruple 1.1-inch, 75-caliber Chicago piano mounts and 1850-caliber M2 Browning machine guns. Both of these weapons were somewhat ineffective against air attacks and were later replaced by Beaufort's 40mm mounts and 20mm Orlikon autocannons, which would become the standard anti-aircraft weapons of the U.S. Navy by 1943. Washington's keel was laid down on June 14, 1938, at the Philadelphia Navy Yard, and she was launched two years later in June 1940. When completed, she had an overall length of 728 feet a beam of 108 feet, and a draft of 32 feet. She had a standard displacement of 35,000 tons, and when fully loaded with ammunition and stores, she would displace 44,800 tons. Washington was protected using the all-or-nothing armor scheme. Her main armor belt was 12 inches thick, deck armor was 5.5 inches thick, and 16 inches of armor protected the faces of her gun turrets. Her barbettes were also protected by 16 inches of armor, and her conning tower had 14.7 inches of armor protection. Her class would begin the trend of U.S. battleships, not being armored to protect against guns of their own caliber, as had been standard Navy doctrine in all of the previous standard type and dreadnought classes. The South Dakota and Iowa classes would have better overall armor protection, but they were still not rated against guns of their own caliber. This would be the driving force behind the design of the Montana class of U.S. super battleships that would be designed after the Iowas, but eventually canceled before any were laid down. Washington was powered by four General Electric steam turbines, 
each driving one propeller shaft, and using steam provided by eight oil-fired Babcock and Wilcox boilers. Rated for 121,000 shaft horsepower, her turbines were capable of producing a top speed of 28 knots. However, Washington would suffer from extreme vibration problems while running at high speed. These vibrations were caused by her twin skegs, not having the strength to withstand the thrust and torque created by her screws. This was a big concern for the Navy, since the South Dakota and Iowa classes were designed in the same manner and were at that time already on their slipways in various states of construction. The problem was particularly bad near the aft main battery director, and her optical fire controls couldn't be used. Piping sprung leaks within the engineering spaces, and everything in those spaces required additional reinforcing and bracing to limit damage from the vibrations. North Carolina had the same problem, and from it, the yard had produced a solution. This involved changing out her screws into a configuration that caused the least amount of vibrating to happen. Her original screws would be replaced with two four-bladed screws on the outer shafts and two five-bladed screws on her skegs. The problem was never fully corrected during either of their careers. Washington was equipped with the latest radar technology of the time, including a CXAM air search radar set. She was also commissioned with three Mark III fire control radar sets for her main battery and four Mark IV radars for her secondary battery. Washington would receive an SG surface radar set during a refit in July 1942. Later on in the war, she received an SK air search radar set, which replaced the CXAM set that was outdated by then, and a second SG set, while her Mark III radars were replaced with the more advanced Mark VIII. Her Mark IV radars were replaced with a combination of Mark XII and Mark XXII sets, which was the case on most U.S. ships as the war progressed. Washington was commissioned into the fleet on May 21, 1941, and conducted her shakedown cruises off the eastern seaboard with her sister and the new carrier Wasp. During this time, she was the flagship of Battleship Division 6. When war broke out in December, she was anchored at Lynn Haven Roads near Norfolk. She continued training off the eastern seaboard until being ordered to reinforce the British home fleet in March 1942. She got underway on March 26 for British waters, arriving there on April 4. During the transatlantic crossing, Washington would lose an admiral when Rear Admiral John W. Wilcox Jr. was swept overboard during a furious North Atlantic storm. After arriving in Scapa Flow, she started familiarizing herself with the home fleet in preparation for operations. In late April, Task Force 99 was created with Washington as the flagship to escort and protect convoys heading to Soviet ports from German capital ships stationed in Norway. During this time, she would suffer minor damage when a British destroyer was cut in half by the battleship King George V in front of her, and the destroyer's depth charges went off underneath her as they sank. In early June, she received a visit from King George VI for an inspection. She would continue in this supporting role until heading back across the Atlantic in mid-July to the Brooklyn Yard for an overhaul. During this refit, Washington would receive her first SG surface radar set, and it would be installed on the foremast just beneath the forward sky control. The location of the new radar set was immediately pointed out by senior members of the gunnery department as being a bad spot to install it, as it had good command to all bearings forward of amidships, but would provide an 80-degree arc of blindness aft. They immediately phoned the chief of the Bureau of Ships to request it be mounted atop the foremast, where it would provide a full compass bearing of 360 degrees. The Bureau denied this request, and the set was mounted where it was ordered to be mounted. This would have significant ramifications during the night action off Guadalcanal in mid-November. During this refit, Washington would also trade in her remaining 50 caliber machine guns for more Ehrlichons. Washington got underway for the Pacific in late August and arrived there in mid-September, immediately becoming the flagship of Rear Admiral Willis Lee. Her role here would be escorting the vital and vulnerable carriers of the Pacific Fleet. She also found time to escort convoys bound for Guadalcanal. Washington would continue in this capacity until mid-October, when she was transferred to the newly created Task Force 64, 
along with other surface combatants, under the command of Lee. Washington and her pals in Task Force 64 wouldn't see much more than probing action during the Battle of Santa Cruz in late October, as the Japanese centered their efforts on the carrier task forces. But, in an effort to help the beleaguered 1st Marine Division on Guadalcanal, Washington along with South Dakota would be dispatched on November 13th from protecting the only operational American carrier left in the theater to intercept a Japanese bombardment group headed for the canal. The two battleships would make their way, along with four escorting destroyers, through Iron Bottom Sound to the strait between Savo Island and the northwest coast of Guadalcanal. At around 2300 hours on November 14th, Washington's new SG radar set indicated targets north-northwest, making 21 knots in two columns at a range of 18,000 yards. As the information was relayed to Lee on the bridge, he took a drag from a cigarette, looked over his shoulder to Captain Glenn Davis, and casually said, Well, stand by, Glenn. Here they come. Approximately 15 minutes later, Washington opened fire with her 16-inch main battery guns and hurled 42 rounds at Japanese light cruiser Sendai over the next several minutes. At about the same time, her 5-inch battery engaged another enemy ship that was attacking South Dakota. The battleship's four escorts were then knocked out of the fight by a combination of gunfire and long lance torpedoes, thus leaving the two battle wagons alone to slug it out. Lee looked on as Washington and South Dakota passed through the debris field left by the destroyers. Shortly after this, Lee lost contact with South Dakota as she turned in the other direction, away from Washington, to avoid a collision with a burning destroyer. Electrical failures caused the new battleship to lose power and steam onward in complete darkness. This is where the placement of Washington's SG radar became a problem. For several minutes, she tracked a target but could not confirm whether it was South Dakota or the Japanese. The blind spot in her radar field handcuffed her. Had the SG radar been mounted where the gunnery department wanted it, they would have seen South Dakota was off her starboard quarter. Since he could not see, nor talk to South Dakota, Lee had to check his fire to avoid a repeat of the night before. Then suddenly, the Japanese battleship Kirishima illuminated and fired on South Dakota eliminating all doubts as to which ships were friend or foe. After this, Washington engaged Kirishima in the first head-to-head -head confrontation of battleships during the Pacific War. In about seven minutes, Washington, using radar-directed gunfire, sent 75 rounds of 16-inch and 107 rounds of 5-inch gunfire downrange, scoring at least nine direct hits, but possibly as many as 20, with her main battery and about 40 hits with her 5-inch battery. The Kirishima was left burning and exploding and would sink later in the morning, while Washington would make it through the entire action unharmed. After this pivotal battle, Washington remained in South Pacific waters until April 1943, protecting carrier groups and task forces engaged in the ongoing Solomons campaign. She left the South Pacific for a much-needed overhaul at Pearl Harbor in May 1943. During this overhaul, her Chicago piano mounts would be replaced with 10 quadruple mounts of 40mm Bofors guns, and more Ehrlichons were added to bring her total to 64 of the single mount autocannons. She also received a new set of screws, but they once again failed to remedy the vibration problems completely. After leaving the yard in mid-July, Washington trained in Hawaiian waters before getting underway once again for the South Pacific. Here, for the next several months, she would train with the carrier task forces for the upcoming campaigns in the Central Pacific. Washington would then participate in the Gilbert and Marshall Islands campaigns, where she would provide shore bombardment and fire support when not screening for the carriers. On December 8th, she would bombard the island of Nauru along with battleships North Carolina, South Dakota, Alabama, Indiana, and Massachusetts. This battle line, under the command of Admiral Lee, represented the strongest surface fleet that the U.S. Navy had ever assembled to that point. In early January, Washington was assigned to the newly created Fast Carrier Task Force under the command of Rear Admiral Mark Mitcher. Here, she would resume her role, along with the other fast battleships, of screening the carriers and providing protection from air attack.
Task Force 58 would begin operations to take the Marshall Islands in late January. On February 1st, Washington would suffer heavy damage from a collision with Indiana. While maneuvering at night, Indiana, without warning, cut across Washington's path while dropping out of formation to fuel escorting destroyers. After temporary repairs were made, Washington set sail for the Puget Sound Navy Yard in Bremerton, Washington. While in dry dock, another set of screws was installed, and in April, Washington conducted vibration tests. The ship could now steam at high speed without significant issues, but vibration was still excessive at speeds between 17 and 20 knots. Like I said before, this problem would never be fully eradicated during her career. Washington rejoined the fleet in early June, once again becoming Admiral Lee's flagship. She would participate in the operations to take the Mariana Islands and the Battle of the Philippine Sea from June 19th to 20th, where she would operate with the battle line 15 miles west of the carrier force to protect it from any surface threats. After this, the task force would continue to operate in the Marianas and then conduct carrier strikes during July and August. She bombarded the Palau Islands in September before screening the carriers as they struck targets in the Philippines, Okinawa, and Formosa in October. She played an anti-climatic role in the Battle of Lady Gulf, racing north with Admiral Halsey's 3rd Fleet carriers instead of protecting the San Bernardino Strait with Task Force 34 and possibly encountering the Japanese in a surface action with other U.S. battleships. Then, as she closed on the Japanese northern force, for a surface action, was ordered to reverse course and head for San Bernardino Strait with her fellow battle wagons, only to miss the retreating Japanese and any chance at another surface engagement. In mid-November, Washington was transferred to Task Group 38.3 and joined her sister North Carolina and old running mate South Dakota. Lee transferred his flag to South Dakota in what was a bittersweet moment for Washington's crew as he was a beloved leader who had been with them for most of their Pacific journey. The rest of November and December would see the task force conducting airstrikes throughout the Western Pacific. Washington would ride out Typhoon Cobra on December 17th along with the rest of her mates, suffering only superficial damage. Early 1945 saw her screening for carrier strikes in the northern Philippines, the South China Sea, and the Japanese home islands. In February, Washington supported the invasion of Iwo Jima by providing preliminary shore bombardment and fire support. In March, the task force conducted more strikes on the home islands, and Washington would bombard Okinawa on the 24th in preparation for the invasion to come. In mid-April, she would begin providing fire support for the Marines as they headed south down the island. In May, she was detached and sent stateside arriving there on June 23rd for an overhaul. Her yard work was finished by mid-September, by which time the war had ended, and she got underway for the East Coast on October 6th. She took part in Navy Day celebrations in Philadelphia on October 27th and then participated in Operation Magic Carpet. Washington was decommissioned in June 1947 and placed in the Atlantic Reserve Fleet. The Navy considered modernizing her several times, but every design idea was deemed to be prohibitively expensive and were subsequently abandoned. The ship remained in the Navy inventory until June 1, 1960, when she was stricken from the Naval Vessel Register. She was sold for scrap on May 24, 1961, and broken up thereafter. A sad ending for a gallant and legendary ship that served with distinction. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, comment, and subscribe so that we can bring you more insightful content just like this.